go into our next segment here. Uh, as you know, in the D1 monthly meeting, we do not just talk about government-related issues, uh, programs, initiatives. We discuss things that affect our lives as a whole. And today, that's just what we're going to do. Uh, we're going to dive into a subject, a medical diagnosis that is not discussed enough, uh, but is very prevalent within the population of women in District 1, as well as the city of Detroit. Uterine fibroids uh, usually grow in women of childbearing age, and research suggests that they may shrink after menopause. However, research also shows that they are more likely to shrink in postmenopausal white women, uh, more so than in postmenopausal black women. For African American women, fibroids typically develop at a younger age, grow larger, and cause more severe symptoms. When I looked up the factors that affect a woman's risk for having uterine fibroids, these were the first two things that popped up in my initial search. Age, and as I mentioned, uh, older women are at higher risk than younger women, but then the number two thing that I saw was African American race. I have so many women in my life that have uh, had the experience and battled the issue of uterine fibroids uh, that when they're finally able to get past and, 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 and not able to, to bear the pain anymore, they have surgery. Uh, and this surgery has become almost commonplace. You know, it was almost routine. And that's how I thought about it in my mind, routine surgery, because I've always, we've had a conversation, you kind of know, uh, but kind of leave it from there. Last year, I lost a, a, a very, 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 very dear friend of mine, a family friend, um, she was actually my very first chief of staff. Um, I was elected, as you, many of you know, back in 2009. And we found ourselves connected on the campaign trail. She joined the team um, when she did not get out the primary and then joined my office and worked as my very first chief of staff. And we built a relationship um, from then and there. Uh, she was great friends with my wife. My wife is here as well. Y'all give it up for Natrina Tate, Dr. Natrina Tate. So I got to say doctor or I'm going to get in trouble. <laughs> I'm staying out of trouble today. Um, but it, 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 she, she, she had, she had uh, fibroids, went in for the surgery, and didn't make it. And I had never heard that before. Never heard that. And so it beca I became curious, how often does this happen? What, what causes this to happen? And for me, it was important to do whatever I can to try to figure out what I can do to help change this, help bring awareness, help create some level of impact in this world that is affected or in this issue that has affected so many people that are close to me. I can't do this by myself, so I have uh, very um, experienced and qualified individuals that are going to be joining me and helping us go through this conversation. Uh, and if, when I call your name, if you can please join us at the table here, please. I have three speakers. Uh, first up is Dr. Janessa Wakiga. Waginka. Uh, my apologies. Y'all give it up. <laughs> Dr. Janessa. She is an epidemiologist who has worked with the uh, worked at Henry Ford Health in the Department of Public Health Sciences for more than 20 years. She earned her PhD at the School of Public Health at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Dr. Wakinga. Uh, research focus is centered around gynecological disease and care. Y'all give it up again for the, for the doctor. <laughs> Next up, we have Dr. Michelle Thomas. She is a native Detroiter who is currently in pra private practice as an obstetrician, gynecologist at, yeah, at the Southfield OBGYN Associates. Uh, she began private practice in 2004 after being employed for six years at the Henry Ford Health System, where she served, find the page, where she serves as the medical director for the uh, Ascension Providence OBGYN Academic Clinic. She additionally is a, an associate professor at the universe, at Wayne State University School of Medicine, where she was course director. We also have, last but certainly not least, Ms. Tracy Armstrong. Ms. Armstrong is the Detroit ambassador for the Fibroid Association. That is an organization 
dedicated to improving women's health care worldwide with a firm commitment to eradicating menstrual stigma that affects uh, and restricts and endangers women everywhere. Y'all give it up for our panel, please. All right, so I know we have a, a, a brief PowerPoint. Uh, Dr. Wakinga, you're going to kind of lead us off with this discussion on what are uterine fibroids, what are the, the risks, how do we hopefully impact, and then we're going to go into a, a, a bit of a deeper dive in our conversation. So I'll turn the mic over to you, ma'am. Awesome. Thank you so much, and thank you to Godland Church for hosting us today. Um, if you go to the first slide. Perfect. Thank you. So. I am a researcher. I do not provide medical advice. Dr. Thomas here will provide all clinical expertise today. Uh, I'm going to really rush through this so that we have ample time to hear Tracy's story, um, answer questions, um, and, and, and uh, share information. So if we go to the next slide. Uh, the talk overview, I'm going to tell you what fibroids are, talk about some treatments, hit on racial disparity. It's a huge one and probably the biggest one in, in health, in my opinion, uh, and tell you a little bit about what researchers are trying to do. So forgive me, I'm going to go fast. So next slide, please. Fibroids are common non-cancerous tumors. We don't know how to prevent them. Uh, they cause many health and quality of life problems, and they're uh, usually diagnosed after you have imaging, which includes ultrasound uh, or MRI. And half of women with fibroids don't know they have them. But that does not mean they do not have symptoms. And when we talk about imaging, who has imaging? Well, women will tell you when they're pregnant or when you're seeking care for a problem. Otherwise, uh, th uh, women do not have uh, imaging. Dr. Thomas, do you want to add anything no, to this? OK. Mm -hmm. All right, I'm going to constantly <laughs> defer to Dr. <laughs> Thomas here. So if we go to the next slide. Ah, we have a uter uh, uterus full of fibroids here. They are rubbery-like tumors. Um, you can have multiple fibroids in a single uterus. So if the uterus is about the size of a fist, fibroids can be the size of a pea, the size of a grape, uh, the size of a golf ball, a softball, a baseball, a volleyball. Um, they can be huge. So as those are added to your uterus, your uterus gets bigger, it can press on your bowel, it can press on your bladder. Um, and sometimes uh, doctors will say that's an 18-week fibroid uterus. Um, did you want to explain that? So a lot of times we use the 18 weeks in analogy to how far a pregnancy is. So I will break that down and tell someone that's equivalent to like a four to five month size of the womb during pregnancy. So even though they're not pregnant, their uterus is the size of a pregnant uterus. If we go to the next slide, please. Awesome. Oh, uh, I think back one more. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, uterine fibroid symptoms. Here we go. Uh, heavy, gut, uh, heavy bleeding, pelvic pain, and infertility are the most common symptoms. And we're talking about heavy menstrual bleeding that can lead to anemia. Um, and anemia can uh, require supplements, uh, medications, and blood transfusions. Sometimes women with fibroids don't have symptoms. I think that's, uh, f that's uncommon. And uterine fibroids are the leading cause of hysterectomy. And we'll circle back to hysterectomy in a few slides. So if we go to the next slide, I want to talk a little bit more about this heavy bleeding. Um, we're talking about heavy gushing type bleeding that is too much for pads and tampons, even when changed frequently. Um, as I said, this uh, bleeding can lead to anemia. Uh, your doctor can check for anemia with a blood test, which is ironic a little bit. But they're looking at your hemoglobin level. Um, and this heavy bleeding is not normal. So if you're, you're standing up and you get that whoosh of blood and you, you're wearing a couple pads and tampons, you're, you're staining your furniture, you're staining your bedding, um, you're constantly running to the bathroom, this is not normal and you need to talk to someone like Dr. Thomas. Is there anything you'd like to add to that? Or? No, and I think um, the emphasis is that a lot of times women walk around and think things are normal for them. They don't necessarily have a comparative. You don't know how much someone else is bleeding. Um, and when you, when you ask patients, um, how frequently are you changing your pad or your tampon, and 
when they describe what Dr. Wingeka said in terms of gushing or they actually are soiling their clothing, you kind of have to emphasize to them this is not a normal pattern of bleeding. And they may say, I've been doing it for three years. I didn't know that this is not normal. Or they might say, my, this is what my mom did. This is what my sisters yeah. do. So um, if we go to the next slide, risk factors for uterine fibroids. Number one, if you are black or African-American, uh, you are the highest risk for having uterine fibroids. Uh, by the time uh, they reach menopause, 80% of black or African-American women will have had a uterine fibroid. That's approximately 70% in white women as a comparator. Uh, we were talking about premenopausal, but we're as it, uh, so you, you still have your menstrual periods that still puts you at risk for developing fibroids and your fibroids growing. We are figuring out still what happens in menopause. If you've had no prior live births, um, that puts you at risk for fibroids. And it's weird, but we're finding that if you uh, are a current or past tobacco smoker, um, you're at lower risk, but please do not smoke. <laughs> I think it's the worst thing you can do for your health. But it's giving us insight, it's telling us where we need to take our research. We need to figure out what's happening. And if we go to the next slide, uh, some treatments for fibroid symptoms. So these are not treating the fibroids themselves. The Depo-Provera injectable, oral contraceptive pills, and um, sometimes the doctor can place uh, an IUD, an intrauterine device that, um, that releases hormones. And this is to try and help um, control the bleeding. So um, Dr. Thomas, is there anything you'd like to add to this slide? Um, I would also just add, um, we didn't talk about pain. Um, mm. A lot of women have pain, significant amounts of pain as well, in addition to bleeding. So oftentimes we're using things to control the uh, pain like Motrin, Advil, Aleve, those type of medications. There are newer medications on the market um, that sort of came out right before COVID where they're designed to uh, work on mm, like the, the receptors on the fibroid to, to block the growth of the fibroids. Um, there's a new class of medications that can be taken orally. Some of the limitations of those medications is the duration. You can only use them for a short period of time usually up to two years, and they do have some side effects as all medications do. And then there's other medications that are designed to help reduce the bleeding during the time of your cycle. So if we go on to the next slide, we have uh, uterine fibroid treatments. So that's uterine artery embolization. This is performed by an interventional radiologist, so not a gynecologist. They inject particles, uh, 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 they put the catheter in the femoral artery, inject particles um, to block into the uterine artery to try and block blood flow to the fibroid to try and kill it off a little bit. Um, I think you were just, <laughs> Dr. Thomas was just talking about these. They're called GNRH agonists and antagonists. Um, they can be prescribed by your gynecologist, family medicine doctor, or internal medicine doctor. And she just highlighted those. And the two most common, I think, treatments are hysterectomy and myomectomy, which are performed by a gynecologist. If we go to the next slide. Again, exactly, Dr. Thomas just uh, emphasized, uh, just described these medications. Uh, so we can go on to the next slide. Talking about hysterectomy, which is removal of the uterus or your womb. So you can have a partial hysterectomy, or you can have a total hysterectomy. Uh, the partial hysterectomy means they leave in your cervix. The total hysterectomy means they take out your cervix. When you talk about total or partial hysterectomy, it has no meaning for whether or not they will take your ovaries or your tubes. Those are separate terms and procedures. They take your ovaries, it's oophorectomy. Uh, the, the one or both tube, your one or both fallopian tubes is selpingectomy. But please know if you have a hysterectomy, this ends your childbearing. Um, the surgery can be performed with an open incision or a keyhole incision, which would be a laparoscopic approach. Dr. Thomas. And, and the, uh, that's true. We, um, the medical literature, so sometimes it's really confusing because um, hysterectomy, total hysterectomy means complete removal of the womb. So a lot of times patients don't understand that, so I always encourage if you're having a hysterectomy, ask what is actually being removed. 
So sometimes patients will see the consent saying total hysterectomy and they'll call back the office immediately and say, wait, we didn't talk about total. So as we're saying, it doesn't mean removal of the tubes and ovaries. So um, that's really, really important if you're going that route to discuss what actually is being removed with your doctor. Because if you have a cervix, you still need to get your pap smear, correct? Yes. And the majority of times we do hysterectomy, we, we do remove the cervix. It's really dependent on the patient. Sometimes um, some things that have been, uh, if the patient's had multiple prior surgeries or other risk factors, but sometimes we do leave the cervix. The majority of time we take the cervix. So if we go to the next slide, we're talking about myomectomy, which is surgical removal of the fibroids. Uh, this can be performed with an open or the laparoscopic approach. Uh, it may or may not affect fertility. So um, uh, I think it's sort of you hope, right, that if you have the myomectomy, you hope for a successful pregnancy uh, and, and delivery, but that's not always the case, correct, correct. Dr. Thomas? Correct. So if we move on to the next slide, I want to highlight just what is robotic surgery, what is laparoscopic surgery. So I drive uh, around and I see these signs, we do robotic surgery. Um, that laparoscopic surgery involves those keyhole incisions, that's minim it's called minimally invasive and there are benefits to that. Um, sometimes the surgeon uses a robot to assist them in performing the laparoscopic procedure. So you can have laparoscopic procedures with or without the robot assist. And Dr. Thomas, would you like to come on that? No, that is correct. Um, okay. Some of the benefits to having the minimally invasive procedure is shorter uh, recovery time, better uh, pain control, um, less blood loss actually during the surgery, um, quicker return to work. Um, and we can talk about it a little bit more, um, the limitations. Not everyone is a candidate, however, for the, the robotic or laparoscopic procedure. And um, sometimes, sadly, and we, we talk, when we talk about disparity, um, black women oftentimes present with bigger, larger, more advanced fibroid. So this approach may not be an option. And I have a few slides. Okay. We, will, we will circle back okay. to that. Awesome. So uh, moving on to the next slide, let's talk about racial disparities. So. Staying on theme, on message, everyone knows uh, black women have more and larger fibroids than white women. Uh, black women tend to develop fibroids at younger ages than white women. Black women have a bigger uterus and worse symptoms at time of fibroid treatment. Black women also have a preference, tend to have a preference for uh, uterine sparing treatments. And black women tend to be less satisfied with the available fibroid treatments. I'm sure this is not probably news to anyone in the room. So um, moving on to the next slide, there are impacts to these racial disparities. So when black women are developing uh, fibroids at younger ages, that means they have to make decisions about fibroid treatments at younger ages. So these fibroid treatments may put their fertility at risk. So it may, by having fibroids at younger ages, it may impact uh, their reproductive lifespan. Would you like to comment on that, Dr. Thomas? So it just illustrates, I, I see a lot of fibroids and um, I had two cases within the last three days of having very difficult conversations with very young women in their 20s um, about fibroids that are impacting their life and may impact their future fertility. And it's, it's a very hard discussion to say, I'm gonna do a myomectomy, but try to have a baby within the next year or so when that may not be their path. Their path may be school and work and um, leadership and getting married. So it's always challenging as to say, you know, we're seeing these fibroids in younger patients with way more symptoms, bigger size, that we don't wanna just delay treatment because the concern is worsening symptoms as the years progress on. So it limits choice. Yep. Uh, next slide. And another impact um, of racial disparities is, um, as you were talking mm -hmm. about earlier, Dr. Mm -hmm. Thomas, if black women have more and larger fibroids and they have a bigger uterus at time of treatment, that makes them um, less, they will less 
often benefit from these minimally invasive surgical approaches. As you said, those approaches where um, there's it's quicker return to work, quicker return to usual activities, less blood loss. Um, they're also less likely to benefit from uterine sparing treatments. So if we go on to the next slide, the bottom line is we don't understand the sources of these racial disparities. Um, but we are working hard to try and understand these racial disparities. If we go on to the next slide. Uh, I've been working with the study of environment, lifestyle, and fibroids since it began in Detroit in 2010. Um, if we go on to the next slide, please. Uh, we recruited more than 1,600 black women who self-identified as black or African-American um, from the Detroit area. And the Detroit women showed up. They're like, we're going to do this. There have been plans that they would start this study in Detroit and if needed, move to Atlanta. Oh no, that was not needed at all. So thank you to our participants. <laughs> thank you to the women of Detroit willing to um, step forward and, and participate. So we asked these women to come in every few years to have a, a transvaginal ultrasound and complete questionnaires and um, provide a blood sample so that we can try and understand risk factors. Um, what's really helpful is the way the study is designed. It's called a cohort study. So we can follow folks over time. We can see when that first fibroid develops. And then we can also see, OK, prior to that first fibroid developing, based on their questionnaires, um, what, uh, what, are, uh, what factors came before the fibroid development. So if we go on to the next slide, we have um, a little bit, some results. Again, we're seeing this weird effect of smoking. So again, this is, please do not smoke. Please do not smoke. Um, uh, um, mm -hmm. But again, it's giving us insight into what's, so what may be molecularly happening. So we're trying to start to dive into that. Um, if you have low vitamin D, and um, that makes you more likely to have uterine fibroids, and your fibroids are going to grow um, faster. So, um, and then we're seeing a little, we're looking at environmental toxicants as well. So we're star just starting um, to tease apart some of those effects. So um, did you want to comment on vitamin D at all? I think, you know, we're all vitamin D deficient. <laughs> we live in Michigan. We don't get enough vitamin D. We have melanin. So universally, um, I tell all my patients that we probably need to be supplementing vitamin D levels. Um, I think the data is going to be really compelling coming out about starting vitamin D earlier. We were previously talking to patients just in the perimenopausal um, window, but now we're starting to talk to women of all ages that you need to you be increasing your vitamin D. And I don't, not leaving males out, but I only see women in my practice, so. Um, and it, it's a blood test, 25 OHD, and it's not covered, it's not standard of care. So you have to pay for it. It's, it may be approximately $35. Um, but ask your doctor about that, please. So if we go on to the next slide, here's something, another important result from the self-study. There were two prior studies, the uh, Nurses Health Study 2 and the Black Women's Health Study. They're represented by gray and orange boxes. Those are the sort of the rates at first fibroid that um, people were working under the assumption that this was the reality, right? This was based, they based their, um, their studies on self-report of a doctor diagnosis of uterine fibroids. Half of women with fibroids don't know they have them. So with the self-study, we found that it's actually way worse than we thought it was, right? We're seeing women under 30 years, the rate of having fibroids is more than twice what we thought it was. Among women 30 to 34 years, it's approximately twice what we thought it was. And 35 to 39 years, um, we thought it was, it, it's approximately, it's almost twice. So uh, when we really start to look, it's, it's, it's way more common. And so... Uh, maybe, you know, not to influence practice, but hopefully we influence practice that maybe the family physician doc, the internal medicine doc might say, she's under 30, she's got some heavy bleeding, maybe these are fibroids. She's not too young to have fibroids. So um, moving on to the next slide, but we haven't made enough progress. 
um, what have we failed to consider? And we have failed to consider the sociocultural model of fibroid disease and experience. And you're thinking, what jargon is she throwing at me now? So if we go to the next slide, this is a very sort of busy slide, but what we have failed to do is we have failed to consider um, experiences of discrimination as exposures. We have failed to um, consider uh, community level factors. We have failed to consider uh, chronic stressors. Um, we failed, considered, failed to consider coping mechanisms, resilience, uh, religious involvement. So when you know better, you do better, right? So if we go to the next slide, um, May 1st, uh, so I'd like to introduce you on the left is Dr. David Williams of Harvard University, for, formerly at the University of Michigan. He is a sociologist who um, developed questionnaires to measure lifetime discrimination. And in the middle, we have Dr. Erica Marsh, who is uh, unable to attend today. Sh she should be here, but she's at the, the ACOG, the, her, the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists. Their national meeting is today, so she's there. And there I am. The three of us um, on May 1st received a, a large a grant award from the National Institutes of Health to start to understand, tr try to understand um, some of these factors, to understand uh, also the discrimination in the medical care system, um, and also with the goal of developing uh, communication tools to assist patients and providers in discussing um, uh, fibroid uh, care. And um, I'll stop there, open it, uh, turn it over to Tracy, but I want to give out two plugs. One, the next slide is for um, the White Dress Project. Um, this p the Peace Project I just introduced is with Kanika Gray Valbrun. Um, so this is a resource. Uh, you can, it's online community information. Um, so please reach out. And also the next slide, I'll put a plug in for the Fibroid Foundation. Um, so Satiria Venable is a fibroid friend of mine, and, um, and this is a great resource. So I, I'll let Dr. Thomas add any comments she wants and let um, Tracy Armstrong share her personal story.